Thank you so much for coming. So I'm really very grateful to be here and truly humbled uh, by the work of so many incredible fellows. And let me start with a point uh, about the connection between this panel's two presentations. A familiar critique of today's university is the siloization of different disciplines. In this context, multidisciplinary institutions like Radcliffe take on an important role, and architecture departments may also serve as a model. The two research agendas that will be presented today, mine about architecture's cross-section with history and humanities, and Sawako's with engineering and technology, take place under the institutional structure of one discipline. I believe both of us show uh, the relevance of architectural studies for responding to today's global challenges, but simultaneously question our profession's current practices for foreclosing this significance. So at Radcliffe, I'm starting uh, a book titled Right to Heal, Architecture in Post-Conflict and Post-Disaster Societies. I intend to explore architecture and urbanism's role uh, in the reconstitution of societies after internal conflicts. I want not only to critically expose architecture's complicit role in conflicts, but also to demonstrate its potential for reparations after socioeconomically, politically, and environmentally connected disasters. A lot has been said about reconstruction of cities after wars, but we hardly confront the trauma inflicted by internal perpetrators, by rulers, sciences, and institutions that are meant to protect the individuals on whom they impose conflict and disaster. Before I read a short excerpt, uh, let me give you a sense of what gets carried from my previous work into this project. The first theme would be intertwined history and history's accountability. A constant theme in my writing is a commitment to a globally inclusive account of the past, building transnational solidarities or sharpening critical tools against imperial imagination requires, first and foremost, rewriting the past by giving due acknowledgement to its multiple makers. There's enough evidence to write the history of modern world architectures in a radically intertwined way rather than as derivatives of Europe and North America, or as essentially different artifacts as if they were produced in isolated regions. So my book, Architecture and Translation, was a step in this direction, offering an alternative model for global history by developing a vocabulary based on translation theories. This world map uh, traces the architect's roots in the book. I defined translation as the migration of not only people, but also ideas, images, objects, technologies, and information from one place to another, and their transformations in new locations. Far from a depoliticized description of these migrations, however, translation theory allows to record the geopolitical tensions, psycho psychological anxieties, and uneven power dynamics. For me, global history is not necessarily circumnavigating the entire planet, but understanding the connectedness of the world in its every compartment. And my recent book, Open Architecture, was also a global history, even though it concentrated on one immigrant neighborhood in Germany. A large number of established and up-and-coming international architects were invited to build public housing here, making it a microcosm of architectural discourse between 1960s and 90s. So this is uh, the visual table of contents of the book. Basically, the reader takes strolls in the neighborhood and stops at seven locations to trace both the local and global forces acting on design. So what would I carry from this theme to the new project Right to Heal? I would say not only the analysis of international connections in conflicts and disasters, but also the accountability of history writing in producing ignorance that brings conflicts and disasters. For an inclusive history, I invite historians to step slowly out of their expertise areas and stop perpetuating knowledge about the same places. To that end, uh, I defined a transitional project for myself before landing on next chapters and organize events about the intertwined histories of US and the seven countries that are subject to Donald Trump's Muslim ban. This research was an activist performance aiming to refute 
the historical assumptions of the clash of civilizations rhetoric that perpetuates wars, borders, and travel bans, and to contest these countries' inaccessibility with the acknowledgement that this gesture is bound to remain incomplete because the same geopolitical order confines scholars as well. If you're interested, I'll soon give a talk about Harvard University's involvement in Iraq, um, but let's move on. Two, uh, architecture's complicity or subversive role. Previously, I looked at architecture's place in state-led modernism, colonization, nation building, and anti-immigrant contexts, and showed how architects often found themselves complicit with translations from above, policies against equal rights for immigrants, and hindrance of public housing. But it was important for me to also excavate practices that moved toward collaborative and cosmopolitan understanding despite the dominant regimes. To give an example, the urban renewal in Berlin's immigrant neighborhood Kreuzberg in the 1980s took place in the context of the discriminatory housing laws instituted by the Senate, such as the ban on entry and settlement and the moving quota justified as an integration of Middle Eastern immigrants, uh, the, Senate the Senate's regulations prohibited the movement of additional migrant families to certain boroughs and mandated that only 10% of residential units be rented to non-citizens in West Berlin. These laws were transposed into the functional program of new buildings during Kreuzberg's urban renewal in the form of the low percentage of new big flats which would have been fitting for the migrant families. Namely, this program would either diminish non-citizen families' chances to move into new public housing or welcome them only if they change their lives to fit the German family size standards. So the book discloses how policymakers used architecture as a mechanism of social control and displacement but at the same time also discusses how architects responded with varying degrees of complicity, irony, or subversion to these discriminatory housing regulations. For instance, a group of architects mobilized tenant organizations, squatter demonstrations, refugee and guest worker participation to carry out a radically democratic urban renewal so that no single immigrant family was unwillingly displaced. Thus, the Senate's 10% mandate and discriminatory laws were subverted by a group of professionals employed by the Senate itself. So analyzing such examples, I ask, what would have happened if architecture was shaped by a new ethic of hospitality toward the immigrant? And I call this open architecture. The chapters define formal, programmatic, or procedural strategies toward open architecture such as open architecture as collectivity, as radical democracy, and as multiplicity. Three, a related historiographical team is multiplying the voices that speak for the built environment. In addition to underrepresented architects from around the world, this also means including habitants' voices in historical narratives. For instance, after ringing every bell in Kreuzberg between 2009 and 17, I tried to configure immigrant voices through a genre inspired by oral history and storytelling. An oral historian refrains from representing an entire ethnicity or group and adds the name of the underrepresented individual into history. And a storyteller acknowledges that the fabric of everyday life in an individual's experience is also part of a building's history. In this approach, architectural history does not end when the building leaves the hand of the architect. And opening the definition of architecture to resident appropriation was also a feminist gesture to write more women into architectural history. By honoring the stories of resident architects, it is possible to stop seeing architecture as an occupation historically practiced by men. And indeed, immigrants appropriated many apartments designed by high-end architects. Bridges were repurposed as bedrooms. Voids were mechanized as kitchens. Unfunctional winter gardens were turned into playrooms. Additional rooms were integrated into apartments from next door buildings that were on higher levels. These oral histories and architectural analysis reveal the agency of immigrants who rightfully take credit for the success of urban renewal 
and Kreuzberg's special place in global imagination today. Here you see images uh, from my exhibition on this book, which featured maps, photos, and video installations produced during research, rather than the archival drawings. And four, finally, the most relevant theme for, from my previous work for the chapter I chose to read today is architecture's relation to human rights. The current regime impairs immigrants' right to have rights. Ever since its first declaration, natural and civil rights, birth and nationhood have been collapsed into each other, making citizenship the necessary condition to have rights and denying many rights to non-citizens. The Berlin Senate could pass discriminatory housing laws because the immigrants were not protected by citizenship rights. Needless to say, migration is one of the biggest global challenges of our century, but current international laws throw migrants out of protection. The refugee or the stateless continues to embody a prolific condition, but nothing exposes the unresolved contradictions of cu current human rights as effectively as the concept of refugee. Because human rights are defined under the precondition of being a citizen of a state in the first place. So the chapter that I just wrote for Right to Heal also thinks about the relation between human rights and urbanism. And let me now read an abbreviated first draft, and it is a first draft. On March 21, 1995, Hasan Ocak was taken into state custody and never came back. When his relatives searched for him in police stations, they always got the same reply that he had never been there. As family and friends continued a sit-in for his release, they found a photograph of his tortured body in forensic office and learned that his corpse was discovered in a forest and buried in the cemetery for unknown people. On Saturday, May 27, his mother and siblings made their first weekly demonstration at Istanbul's Galatasaray Square together with five families in the same situation. They called themselves Saturday Mothers, referring to the mothers of Plazo de Mayo in Argentina, who visited them on one of those Saturdays. As their determination grew, so did the police violence. As weeks passed by, more mothers came to demonstrations. Hassan's mother aged, but his younger sister and brother took active roles. The mother died, but the family's newborn children joined, and then came other human rights activists. Hassan Ocak is one of the thousands and thousands around the world who has not returned from state custody, and this paper is about those left behind. The Saturday Mothers of Turkey, a growing group of mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, wives, husbands, children, grandchildren, aunts and uncles, as well as human rights defenders and citizens in solidarity, have been asking for the whereabouts of 1,353 individuals by protesting at Istanbul's Galatasaray Square every Saturday since 1995. This movement invites discussions on human rights, feminism and gender, psychoanalysis of mourning and memory. Today I would like to add a spatial and visual studies perspective by analyzing works of art, architecture and urbanism from the framework of transitional justice. Hasan Ocak's case is a typical example of what is now named as enforced disappearance. And the state's denial of accountability is a violation of right to truth. Both are recognized as crimes in international law since 2006 through a convention signed by 98 countries and ratified by 62. Even though enforced disappearance existed for a long time, UN and Amnesty International have warned that the practice actually increased and spread over the world after 1980, with systematic cases in Argentina, Chile, China, Germany, Iraq, Russia, Spain, Sri Lanka, USA, and many others. Just like refugees, those subject to enforced disappearance expose how modern states turn bodies into what Georgia Agamben called bare life, in the sense that states hold the power to deprive citizens of their political rights pushing them outside the realm that should have been protected by citizenship and therefore human rights. Moreover, turning humans into bear lives gives those states necropower. As Ashil Membe coined the term, it gives statecraft a license, a presumed right to kill with impunity. The history of transitional justice is tightly related to enforced disappearance. 
the accountability of past abusers came to the forefront of human rights movements with the grassroots protests against disappearance, such as Mothers of Plazo de Mayo, starting in 1977. The concept of transitional justice entered the lexicon of international law as new nations emerged out of the end of Cold War and with conflicts in Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Today, transitions from civil wars, genocides, apartheid, coup d'etats, as well as reparations to heal from colonization and slavery are topics of transitional justice. The Saturday mothers of Turkey make three specific demands, to know what happened, to see perpetrators punished, and to find the disappeared or remnants of bodies so that they can bury their dead. Over the years, they have also shown solidarity with other atrocities in the country's history. Namely, Saturday mothers appeal for truth, justice, and a space for their relatives, and by extension, a moral and institutional reform for the broader society. The right to truth is one of these goals that oversees the right of relatives and society to know the truth about state brutality and human rights violations in the past, which have been obscured due to denial of responsibility and distortion of facts in official national histories. Truth and recognition of suffering is a prerequisite for healing. As Michael Ignatiev put it, quote, the new human rights culture has been accompanied by the global diffusion of the psychoanalytic ideas about the healing power of truth, end of quote. Far from being result, however, the right to truth has often injected a dilemma into the healing process because truth commissions that were established during transitional periods often secured amnesties to perpetrators in return for collaboration. Truth, in other words, was revealed at the expense of criminal justice. Transitional justice is unresolved also because subsequent regimes were usually far from perfect and their truths and their justices were also partial. Moreover, the assumption of the objectivity and universality of international law is rightly debated, and the framework to reconcile the international and place-based justice systems remain under-theorized. In this context, transitional justice needs to be conceived as a continually evolving, open platform where societies formulate new forms of justice and peace-building steps. In this literature, art and architecture usually get referenced for their role in reparations and forward-looking restorative justice rather than retrospective and corrective mechanisms such as truth commissions and trials. Memorials and museums about atrocities may not be able to compensate for the past, it is suggested, but can become forms of apology to build more just societies in the future. While this is certainly important, I would argue that Saturday mothers reveal a much larger role. And let me explore an alternative history of the public square where mothers demonstrate every week. Countless interviews with relatives in Istanbul and Kurdish majority towns have revealed that they cannot grieve their losses with conventional mourning rituals. Berfo Kırbayır, who died at age 105, left the house door open every night after 1980 hoping that his son, Cemil, would return. While depriving citizens of their political rights and turning them into bare lives, state violence simultaneously throws their relatives out of the sphere of social mourning. Reading Freud's seminal text, Mourning and Melancholia, critically, we may ask how much ordinary forms of mourning could work for subjects who have been excluded from the socially constructed definition of the normal. Melancholy the inability to have closure in grief is not a pathological response as it would have been deemed in the normative Freudian psychoanalysis, but the only option left to relatives which they have fought back by turning perpetual grief into activism. Mourning and protesting in one of the busiest public spaces in Istanbul helped to live with the ungrievable death. Every week, the relatives brought red flowers to the square that they would have otherwise taken to cemeteries. Yet the Galatasaray Square has not only served as a symbolic cemetery and a public demonstration site. It has also become something like a truth commission of transitional periods, even though the state not, did not admit accountability. During my interview with Masida Ojak and Sebla Arjan, who were among the initiators of the movements, both women emphasized it would not have been possible for the relatives or the public 
to realize that enforced disappearance is a systematic state policy unless new mothers and witnesses kept showing up in the square to tell their own stories. Struggle for visibility was not only a cry to be seen, but also a truth-telling platform. No wonder the government first wanted to relocate the demonstration to an obscure site and then to block it. Additionally, the square may have also become a platform for prospective justice. In interviews, some relatives suggested that their public visibility prevented the state from committing further crimes and that the number of disappearances decreased over time. Those who survived state custody came to Saturday meetings and declared that the police spared them because they knew their mothers would join the movement. Namely, the city square built the social movement, but also vice versa. In an exhibition about 500 plus years of the Galatasaray school and square, three of the 10 contemporary artists inserted Saturday mothers into the long canonic history of the area. In his piece Saturday, Barış Ülker transformed a typical class photo into a blurred image composed of a collage of mothers holding portrait photographs of the disappeared in front of the school's gate. The artists reproduced images from the past 25 years on Xerox paper, reminiscent of street flyers and posters, and transitioned them on silk surface. The choice of this medium resulted in layered images that blurred each other and mirror images that inverted the names of the disappeared, making them partially illegible. For the artist, the making of this pictorial fog was also a matter of personal healing. Remembering his early encounters, he said, I can see, but I'm also blinded by the weight of it all. I'm a teenager. I cannot come to terms with it. I walk on. It's a Saturday. It is every Saturday. I know this, and I don't know it at all. Ülker questions himself for his failure to actually see the Saturday mothers. He inhabits the role of the common man, a group of quite diverse people joined in their hostility against the other. For years, we resisted to see what could not be unseen and what Saturday mothers really showed. Shortly after their demonstration was banned in 2018, a group of Saturday mothers visited the exhibition and left their red flowers under Ülker's work, the flowers that they would bring to Galatasaray Square every week and that they would have otherwise taken to cemeteries. Ülker's work also reminds us the power of the portrait photograph through which the disappeared appears in the city. Reports of human rights organizations expose that regimes learned the apparatus of enforced disappearance from each other, but so did the resistance. Over the years, the portrait photograph in the public space has consistently proven its power as a form of transnational solidarity. Mothers of Argentina came up with creative performances to make the disappeared appear in public space using silhouettes and masks. And the most common form has been the portrait photograph with the victim's name on it and a question about the whereabouts, which jumped between Argentina, Turkey, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Iran, El Salvador, and many places. Some demonstrators use state ID photographs appropriating the disciplinary power's visual field to a subversive effect. The portrait photograph in public protests exposed the intrinsic ungrievability of the disappeared. Many authors who theorized photography from Walter Benjamin to Susan Sontag commented on the photograph's role in freezing time. In periods of transitional justice, time is also suspended because it affects the living and the living dead differently. Nothing exemplifies this better than an anecdote of a Saturday mother. When she held up the portrait photograph of her husband who disappeared in his 20s 30 years ago, someone asked if she was looking for her son. She had aged, but her husband's photograph has not. The photo and audio installation on the wall by Eileen Tekiner brings the audience face to face with this fact. Tekiner turns the camera away from the public square to domestic spaces where mothers keep the memories of the disappeared. The audience puts the still image on the wall into time throughout the duration of the audio. Time passes for those in the living world, but is frozen for those in the disappeared. The overwhelming presence of the portrait photograph is noticeable in the pictures, whether in size, placement, or relocation to other objects. 
many relatives make a connection between the portrait and the missing grave. Our graves are the melancholic photographs on our walls, Gülbahar Alpsoy says, whereas Iqbal Eren explains that they did not dare to put his brother Hayrettin's photographs up for the last 34 years because that would have meant to admit his death. The portrait photograph as witness in Grassroots Truth Commission and standing in for the missing grave in the suspended time brings me to my final point, the memorial. After Truth and Justice, Saturday Mother's third public demand is a space for the remnants of their relatives. Over the years, as hopes that the disappeared will return dwindled, the motto of the moment became, we want our bones and to bury our dead, a request that reappeared in countless transitional justice cases. As there are no official memorials to show you today, I will comment on the memorials to come that commemorate the truth to be discovered about the bones to be found of the humans who have disappeared. During my meeting with Saturday Mothers, we discussed possible locations for memorials and a provisional list emerged. And here is the list, the Galatasaray Square, a public plaquette in front of every building where the disappeared were taken from their homes. Sansaryan Han, Istanbul's infamous torture space, the mothers would like to see the repurposing of this building into an apology museum rather than a five-star hotel. And finally, the cemeteries where the disappeared bodies or their bones have been found, reburied, or hope to be buried when found. Here, I could have easily closed this presentation with an overview of apology memorials around the world as examples of architecture's contribution to right to heal, despite the commercialization and contradictions of some. Instead, I would like to end by showing the place of architectural history in right to truth rather than prospective justice alone. That the Saturday Mothers repeated the names of cemeteries in our meeting is not accidental. The missing graves of the disappeared raises the question that Judith Butler asked, what makes a grievable life? Why does the state apparatus consider some lives mournable but others so unmournable that it denies them graves? If we zoom out of the Galatasaray Square to its surroundings and compare all their new maps, it would be clear that in Istanbul, it was not only the people, but also the graveyards that disappeared. A map analysis reveals the disappearance of the Muslim small cemetery during Pera's transformation from a land of grapes and graves to a city of elite households and hotels during the Ottoman Empire's integration into capitalism. As Mehmet Kantel researched, the edges of the cemetery were in constant pressure due to the rising prices. Following the cholera ep epidemic, a wall was built around, changing the cemetery from a public passageway and recreational area into a border that separated the wealthy from the poor. When Tunnel, the world's second subway, was constructed in 1873, the graveyard, graveyard or the Mevlevi Lodge was expropriated and the debris that came out of the excavation for the subway was dumped on the small cemetery. A new life started over the totally covered, non-courtly Muslim graves, and the area came to be known for its best views in town that attracted tourists to canonic hotels. If Frank Gehry's design is constructed, its basement will dig nine floors deep so that cars will replace the bones as the final act of the grave's total obliteration. The second cemetery around Galatasaray in today's Taksim and Gezi Park used to be the site of the non-Muslim cemeteries. After the cholera epidemic and pressured by the real estate, the new land law of 1869 dictated to carry all cemeteries to the outskirts. Despite some public dissent, municipal authorities negotiated the re relocation of Catholic, Protestant, and Greek Orthodox graves. But following a couple of attempts to expropriate the Armenian cemetery and its church, the negotiations had remained unresolved when World War I broke. After the Ottoman Empire dissolved, the Turkish Republic confiscated the land in 1939 through extra legal means by denying the Armenian patriarch lawful ownership of the land. Modern buildings and hotels stand today on this site. Revealing the history of the eight year long court case that resulted in this dispossession, Nalji and all, all the right, only after confrontation and official apology, perhaps we can finally bury our dead. 
It is not a coincidence that both Saturday mothers and historians of the Armenian cemetery conclude their words with the same request, to bury their dead. Throughout their 25 years of demonstration, the Saturday mothers have shown solidarity with other historical atrocities and have been joined by other activists. For instance, on their 683rd meeting, they revealed and memorialized the 250 Armenian intellectuals in Istanbul who have been subject to enforced disappearance in 1915. This was one of the many episodes of demographic engineering after which the newly inaugurated Turkey's 20% non-Muslim population was reduced to less than 3%. The reason that authorities are so threatened by mothers of the disappeared around the world must be because they powerfully reveal an intrinsic truth about the nation state apparatus. They expose how states exploit their dead in the name of the physical, economic, or ideological victory of one group over the other. That's also why the Saturday Mothers Movement is more than a search for personal grieving. A mother's right to mourn is also a society's right to heal. So let me now leave the podium to my fellow panelists. Uh, when Savak and I were preparing for this panel, we also discovered some common aspects of our works despite the differences. Both of us seem to open architecture to other forms of inquiry in order to make our discipline directly relevant for contemporary global challenges. And I was particularly impressed by how Sawako's work exposes the current dysfunctional relation between architecture and structural engineering, and in a way sutures them as if to heal both through her stitching. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. As you can see from her, uh, her work, history and theory in architecture provides frameworks, a way forward for the discipline and the profession to reflect and update itself to respond to social, cultural, and political consideration. It provides tools for architects to go against the grain of conventions and the immediate external pressure of what Ezra describes as neoliberal ASOS in her book, Open Architecture, which is a beautiful and thoughtful book. Now, we turn to another aspect of architecture categorized as technology or computational design. Just to give you a bit of a personal context, after finishing my undergraduate studies in Japan, not in architecture, I began my architecture studies in the US my English was definitely the worst among the 13 classmates. I was overwhelmed with the complexity of the architectural vocabulary, let alone the actual content of the education, and felt really dumb. What saved me was computer programming, a language that was fairly new to architecture school, where I felt I had a chance to communicate at the same level with others. Programming language became a way for me to participate in architecture in the specific context and also, though I wasn't aware at the time, a language for me to connect to other disciplines. Now I work across multiple disciplines, including architecture design and structural engineering. The two disciplines that routinely work together in practice for a common goal of realizing great buildings, but constantly struggle to overcome their epistemological differences. I happened to witness an architecture engineer, engineering tension early in my career as I went to work for a structural engineering office in London after graduating from architecture. And ever since, I have been designing technological intervention to reconcile and redesign this problematic relationship. The connection between form and its structural and material consideration has been an integral part of architecture since its beginnings. However, architects and structural engineers today are not builders. They work at the distance from construction materials using various representational systems, often highly abstract and at the same time directed towards the undeniably physical. Material and structures that were understood intuitively and generalized as rules of thumb Represented geometrically using proportional systems became a subject of science requiring the use of algebraic representation and calculation around the mid-17th century in Europe. By the mid-18th century, 
the theory of mechanics has developed and the separation of architecture and engineering started being institutionalized. Ever since, the distance between the two has been increasing with the institutional structures that exacerbate the divergence. The difference in the mode of representation we use to describe material is a factor that makes our communication difficult. If I can make a generalization, architects are more comfortable with geometric and visual, whereas engineers are more accustomed to numerical. Representations are not neutral and conditions the way in which we think and operate. The intervention of digital technologies in this relationship is interesting as they transform the underlying representation of both fields. Today, both architects and engineers use computer software applications such as CAD, computer-aided design, and FEA, finite element analysis, to perform some of their tasks. Though software tools generally facilitate the production within each discipline, they do share a common underlying representation of information in digital form. The fact that consistent representation of problems, intentions, and solution enclosed within each specialization exists is significant, as radically different representation of objects and method become transferable. Therein lies the opportunity for computational methods to renegotiate and update disciplinary boundaries. What you see on the screen are some of the projects, both in practice and academia, that I've worked on. My works are encapsulated in the form of software applications sometimes and in physical design in other instances. Despite the simplistic story of architecture and engineering separation I presented, the idea of integrating form and structure is not new. There have been certain cultural waves promoting different levels of fusion and separation between the two and I wish to engage with the legacy of the ones aiming towards the integration. This is because I come out of the time where so-called freeform architecture designed using newly accessible geometries through computers were being realized, often with tremendous material waste. Okay, with this, today I would like to share a few projects uh, concerning some aspects of material and material representations. Topostruct. Knowing design is a complex human activity where intu intuition plays a significant role in its inception, we developed a series of software tools more than 10 years ago that tries to provide designers an intuitive understanding of some of the engineering concepts. Here we consider intuition as insights gained by practice and feedback, where we use engineering simulation not as predictive, but a learning tool. Topostruct is one of the applications we have developed based on the theory of topology optimization. This is a well-documented method in mechanical engineering that produces notionally optimal material distribution within the given bounds, the gray box, uh, with respect to support, indicated in red, and the load, indicated in blue. Just to give you a little bit of a hint, uh, you might conceptualize Gothic art loading in support condition like this. Or find some concepts in nature that has similar anti-delivering structural concepts. To enhance the understanding of the structural behavior of the solution, we offer multiple ways of visualizing the information, especially the densities, strains, and principal stress directions whose patterns can give an idea to designers about the internal forces that arise in volumes of materials. The software has allowed people with little prior knowledge to, of engineering to acquire an induced understanding of mechanics of materials. In fact, after playing, some, spending some time playing with uh, hypothetical scenarios and observing the topostock results, users tend to anticipate, anticipate the results, as if they have gained this intuitive understanding of the underlying principle. 
Topology optimization converges to a familiar solution such as trust quite often. While we are used to consider trust as made of nodes and struts, this method offers a glimpse into the abstract notion of a trust as a product derived via a process of continuous distribution of material in space. This mere reintroduction of a conventional and familiar system such as a trust, but in unfamiliar terms, is extremely profound as it amounts to a deeper recognition that the objects of our world are not given but shaped. Now I would like to present a project in collaboration with mechanical engineering field. Structural engineering is a branch of mechanical engineering. The project revisits knowledge embedded in traditional construction craft prior to the architectural engineering division. In the past century, structural detail design has been dominated by the use of mechanical fasteners and adhesives to connect elements of industrial materials like steel and concrete. On the contrary, historical timber structures mainly employ the use of interlocking joints in their detailing. Interlocking details can be viewed as a design principle to join multiple components by intelligent use of geometry and material. Although traditional interlocking joints that have been developed and refined over centuries exhibit an enormous body of material knowledge, its application to buildings are limited today and often require mechanical fastening. In this context, our interdisciplinary research project aimed to advance the understanding and designs of interlocking joineries in light of new simulation and fabrication method. I would like to note that our research considers a use of functionally graded material instead of timber, which I will explain later. We started the project by uh, investigating traditional interlocking joineries and its structural behaviors. After spending significant time playing and analyzing with the joints, analyzing the joints, we came to realize there are four main factors that affect the stiffness of the joint, which we studied semi-independently at first. The geometric principles. The geometric principles of interlocking joineries are rather simple, though it took us a long time to decipher this. Most of architectural joints use linear assembly, and if you do not have any undercuts parallel to the assembly axis, you can join two elements. This means we can use any outline geometry on plane perpendicular to the assembly axis. By understanding these two rules, the joineries that seemed overly complex started becoming manageable. Combining these uh, simple rules, one can design quite advanced assembly of elements and also quickly modify the global configuration of elements by controlling the direction of the assembly axis. With this understanding, we designed multi-axis joineries Multi-axis joint is an interlocking joint that can be assembled with another identical joint in multiple ways. This concept can be found in Japanese timber joint design named kawaii tsugite, a three-way joint. Extracting the geometrical principles of this joint, we developed an algorithm to create variety of single body multi-way joints. As an application instance, we designed a toy. If Lego is a brick-based model, ours are frame-based. It was quite popular among 10, year, 10 to 13-year-olds and not so much to the younger ones, as assembly is not easy unless you kind of understand the geometric principles. Now we move to material design. Our research takes a view that microstructure and its composition of every material, including that of wood, will be designed and custom tailored to improve its performance and reliability in the near future. These materials are called functionally graded materials, and one of the methods to materialize such concept is accessible today through multi-material 3D printers. 
The multi-material printer we use, called Object Connex, can print materials with varying elasticity. Here, the magenta indicates stiff and translucent, more compliant material. A typical workflow of using these printers involves creating solid geometries in CAD modeling software that uses boundary representations, BREP, exported as watertight STL meshes, imported to vendor-specific software to assign materials per watertight solid. Basically, BREP assumes that the internal material is homogeneous. Though this approach works, it's difficult to utilize the full resolution of the printer because, for example, it requires more than one million watertight meshes in order to print a five centimeter cube at maximum material resolution using the offset 3D printer. So what we used was a process called voxel printing using data format based on raster image. In this process, geometry along with its material information is transmitted as a sequence of raster layers. This is similar to volume data sets commonly used in uh, medical imaging. Each pixel holds positional and material information in relationship to the printer's work envelope and dimensional characteristic of its smallest material droplet. With this technology, what we initially conceived as a mental representation of material became something that can be brought to reality. However, the process is not trivial. Despite the availability of 3D printing hardware capable of producing high-resolution multi-material objects, access to this new technology is encumbered by the way in which current modeling and simulation tools represent exchange, and process information. CAD, FEA, and the printer all uses different data structure to represent the geometry and material, where we had to develop multiple conversion tools to <laughs> make the process work. As an initial reference study, we documented the case of the cantilever beam structure to illustrate the characteristics of the workflow. In this particular instance, the von Mises stress gradient determines the distribution of the thermoset polymer, the stiff material, and the elastomer, the compliant materials. Principal stress lines are also printed using the same thermoset, the stiffer one, which is analogous to fiber reinforcement. After the case study, we applied the same process to our joinery. And this enabled us to physically prototype joints made with functionally graded materials. To bring the process into yet a larger context in combination with a geometric study, we designed an interlocking table. Composed of five interlocking elements, the table does not require any mechanical fastener for assembly and disassembly. So the assembly sequence is like So just going into the process a little bit, utilizing what we studied in the geometry section, the middle joint is designed based on the Japanese joint called Koneboso Katamuki Dotsuki. This joint is typically used to connect columns and beams in an orthogonal configuration. The geometry of the traditional joint was modified to fit the desirable angle for the table. And at the same time, the tilt of the assembly set ensured the pullout force to be resisted by the ground. Generally, if you change this type of geometry, if you use timber, the fibers will cut in the direction that doesn't make sense. But since we are designing our material, it, we can argue that we could make uh, these type of freedom in design configurations. So following the same material design process, we printed the table leg. Of course, this is a highlight of the table. Is uh, these two legs with grain-like patterns, which are fully printed using multi-material 3D printer. The grain-like pattern in the legs represents the optimal grain reinforcement material orientation for the table. Also, there were other considerations that went into it, 
as uh, such as um, global assembly, combination of assembly directions, and also fitting. But I won't go into detail here. So I just see this table project as a manifestation of future design work where designers not only create geometry, but also design material at the microscopic scale to achieve better integration of function and aesthetics. Friction design. Tangential traction behavior at the contact surface especially, is especially important to the structural performance of the interlocking joint. This is because an assembly axis of the joint element, of course, is poor in resisting the pullout force, regardless of its geometry. While it is desirable that contact surface parallel to the assembly axis can resist high tangential force to avoid dislodging, opposite can be said for the insertion direction. So digital fabrication technologies can achieve a good level of precision in producing complex geometries, it requires many trials and errors to find the right tolerances and insertion force to achieve a good contact quality for interlocking joints. As you can see in the video, in the traditional timber construction, the contact quality relies on the contact pressure fitting of the joint elements. In other words, Ensuring a good fitting at the contact surface is equivalent to applying high value for the normal force, Fn, in the classical static and kinetic friction equation. This condition is achieved by the highly skilled craftsman producing joints with appropriate tolerance in addition to the pounding. So to overcome this difficulty in the fabrication and assembly of interlocking joint, we opt for designing a new mechanism for interlocking contact surface that allows easy insertion while capable of resisting pullout force. The idea is to control the mu, the friction coefficient, instead of Fn, the normal force, where the mu during the insertion is smaller than the mu under pullout force. We were inspired by the classical ratchet mechanism but uh, since it's a contact joinery, we cannot allow vertical perpendicular movements. Therefore, we designed the material arrangement so that we can achieve this condition through material design, geometry and material design. And finally, combining all the aspects, we designed and built an interlocking pavilion. Interlocking pavilion is an architecture prototype composed of structural members with custom-designed interlocking joineries. Each uh, joint geometry is designed with careful considerations on structural forces and puzzle-like assembly and disassembly procedures. Though it's kind of difficult to see in the photos, the individual joint is composed of a mixture of two materials, one that is compliant and one that is stiff. We have designed the distribution of these two materials so as to improve the reliability of joint fitting and to reduce stress concentration in the structure. As you, you can see, we uh, use transparent material. This material se selection is to reveal the uh, locking geometry and its inner workings that were hidden in traditional timber joineries not only because of the opacity of the wood, but also to hide craftsmen's trade secrets. The curious quality created by the material, geometry, and the natural light has invited a lot of visitors to spend a long time observing the joint from multiple directions, which we were very happy about. And of course, not to kill anybody, we did run quite detailed simulations and carefully designed the structure of these things because it gets quite heavy. So this is a video of the process. Because a printer bed is not large enough, we only printed the joinery parts and then used structural glues actually to make the larger elements. But 
since it's linear, it's easy to pack and bring it to the site of construction. And we didn't need to use any hand tools in, in a matter of some few hours, we were able to assemble the entire structure. Although the current technology, due to its material selection and scale, is not immediately uh, deployable for buildings, the pavilion suggests a new mode of detailed design for future architecture and structural design. Finally, I would like to briefly touch on a new project in collaboration with the medical field, specifically with the domain of neuropsychiatry. In this project, we plan to look at frontotemporal dementia, FTD. FTD is a group of neurodegenerative disorders characterized by the loss of nerve cells in frontal and temporal lobes. Magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, is commonly used in FTD diagnostics. In addition to using human eyes to examine the 2D images of brain sections, there are multiple computational techniques, including voxel-based morphology, VBM, that measures volumetric atrophy of the brain, and more recently, diffusion tensor imaging that provides information on the microstructural tissue composition of the brain. This all may sound quite irrelevant to architecture or engineering, but if we abstract the human body as a complex composition of matter in space, architecture may seem quite similar to human body. Synergies between anatomy and engineering is, is also seen in the past, such as in the case of Wolf's Law. Julius Wolf, who was an anatomist and surgeon, based his law on a com comparison of stress trajectories in Kalman's crane, named after a mechanical engineer, Carl Kalman, with a microstructural pattern of trabecular bone. In addition, MRI data analysis is quite interesting to us as a way in which we represent, organize, and generated material information in our previous projects are quite similar to methods used in MRI image analysis. In fact, some of the techniques we used, such as volumetric rendering, were initially developed in and for medical field. The case of Topostruct project as well, we looked at the global geometry as well as the inner trajectories of forces that informs the emergence of the geometry. And this global local relationship to the physical material as well. And in addition, some of the interaction uh, designs we have done may help us comprehend complex inner structures that amount to a particular global phenomenon. Together with my professional partner, Panayotis Mihalatos, currently we are studying MRI-specific information in relation to the medical field and working on developing workflows for us to understand and interact with the medical data. The process of crossing disciplinary boundaries is not trivial and requires significant effort, yet I find this essential to my work. Recontextualization of knowledge help clarify the values and characteristics of my own discipline that is often difficult to articulate otherwise. At the same time, it opens up new perspectives, in this case, towards understanding what material may be. The two talks today presented some aspect of architecture. Generally, Ezra and I are in a different category within architecture, but what we share in common is our will to provide outward orientation to the discipline. The direction that may help redefine the form of communication and at the same time affect the vocabulary of the discourse 
in the internal thought process of designers. Last but not the least, I would like to uh, thank Radcliffe for providing us this amazing opportunity. We're super inspired and humbled to be immersed in this interdisciplinary environment. Thank you so much for our incredible fellow fellows, staff, and student research partners. Thank you.